Welcome back to the Autoblog Podcast. We have a great show for you this week. I'm Greg Migliori. I'm going to bring in news editor Joel Stocksdale. What's up, man? Actually, quite a bit. I <laughs> just turned 30 and now I've got new air conditioning and planted a tree and it's been a crazy week. That is some life moments right there. That is now that you're in your 30s. I mean, you know, hey, that means you get to sleep in or sleep later. You have all the excuses in the world to go to bed early, you know. So, hey, welcome to nearing middle age, I guess. <laughs> Anyways, we got a great show for you. We're going to talk about the Chevy Blazer, the Toyota Crown, and the Ford F-150 Raptor R. They're putting a V8 back in that thing, which I think is pretty awesome. Aston Martin has a new logo. It's a bit different if you look closely. Uh, it's always kind of fun to look at those things. And then as far as our reviews, I've been driving the Ram Rebel GT. Joel has been in something that's pretty hot here, the Porsche 911 GT3S and the Hyundai Elantra N. We have an update on spending money uh, from Blake in episode 726. It involves black wings and Porsche 911s, so you'll want to stick around for that. So let me jump into the news section with my now 30-something colleague here, Joel. Uh, Toyota Crown, uh, one of the longest runnings, I think the longest running nameplate Toyota has used since 1955. Sold in the U.S. Uh, from the 50s until, like, I think 1972. What we've got here is kind of like a high-riding sedan. You could probably call it a crossover, uh, but it, it's basically a sedan. It's just a little higher up off the ground with a little bit of a kind of a, a more of a commanding seating position. It's going to offer some hybrid options. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm a little mixed on how it looks, but overall I would say it looks, looks pretty good. You know, so... I think this is a good move for Toyota. We've heard for years that, hey, they might bring back the crown. What's it going to be? It's all those sort of like navel gazing things that auto journalists and, you know, other people ask, like, what is it? What will the crown be? Uh, but now it's here, replaces the Avalon, which I think that's, I think swapping out names is a, is a good move. I don't think the Avalon had a ton of, you know, brand equity as far as like desirability. It just was sort of like their their large sedan. Using a new name or an old name, I think, allows them to kind of reposition this. And uh, I don't know. I, I think this could be a win for them. What do you think? I don't know. I I think it's weird. Um, <laughs> I, yeah, I, I don't think it'll be bad, I guess. Um, I mean, like, as, as an Avalon replacement, um, a model that doesn't, it's never really sold amazingly, at least in the last few years, because big sedans have just been kind of on the out. I mean, Chevy dropped the Impala not too long ago. Um, I don't know, though. I just I think it's a little weird that. I guess one of the things that I think is really weird about it is that it is genuinely a sedan. It's not a. It doesn't just look like a sedan. It actually has a trunk with a trunk lid. It's not a liftback, um, like say a Kia Stinger. And with the way it's shaped, I'm I'm genuinely kind of shocked because the it seems like you're missing out on a lot of usability. Um, but it's still. It's still something that'll replace the Avalon just fine because it is a pretty sizable vehicle. Um, I mean, admittedly, the Avalon appealed to a much older crowd, and having something with a higher ride height is going to make it easier to get in and out of it. Um, I think it's great that it's going to be offered with hybrid stuff with uh, hybrid powertrains. I don't know. I just think it's. I just think it's kind of weird. <laughs> Yeah, I don't think you're wrong that it's weird. I kind of, I do think there's a market for people that want that higher stance because basically nobody wants a low riding car unless you're looking for something that's truly sporty. So I think that's where like, there's still a sizable sedan segment, but you can get new buyers by saying, hey, look, look at how this looks. Look at the stance, look at where you're going to sit and you can win people there. 
Yeah, I'm of two minds with the like the trunk hatchback thing. You know, I, I think there are some people who actually want trunks and kind of like the look and would go with that. And you can get a pretty like a trunk that's very usable, like a big trunk, like I imagine this will be, can be very functional. Um, you know, I think it's for me, I think it's a creative reuse and like reapplication and like a new entry, if you will, into a segment where I don't think the auto industry knows quite what to do with it. You know, I think we've been seeing things like ways the Ford Fusion could sort of come back somewhat like this. It's just like a little bit elevated riding, higher riding sedan thing. But some of the things we've seen with that, like spy shots and rumors, make it more of a wagon, if you will, but it still has sort of like a car aesthetic. So, you know, again, I think it's a it's a good take, I think, on a segment that's really a tweener. And it's also it's like one car, right? You know, if Toyota wants to spend some money, throw the crown name on it, I think more power to them. Like they're not saying, hey, this is how all of our products are going to be. They're just saying, hey, we're going to try this out, see if it works. You know, like for every Ford Maverick where people were like, well, what's that going to be? You know, this small truck that they already have two other trucks that, you know, isn't as capable, like what are people going to want it for? For every one of those that sort of comes through the like the mist and proves some of the doubters wrong with its sales figures and its like positive reviews, like we all love it basically. You know, there are things like the Honda Cross Tour that, you know, just flamed out pretty quickly. So, you know, I'm optimistic for this because I tend to like car-like styling, but I will say this, if you're going to ask me, put your money on what you think is going to happen here. I would put my money on this being maybe a little bit more like the Volkswagen Phaeton or the Cross Tour, something that's around for five, six, eight years. And then we're writing a story saying, yeah, after years of declining sales, the Toyota Crown disappeared. So I could see it going that way too. Like if you said, handicap this Greg, I would say, well, I don't know, 60% chance it happens that way. But who knows? Yeah. And it's also interesting that in other markets overseas, there are three other versions of the crown that are going to be available. There's going to be kind of a cool, sporty hatchback version, um, kind of a longer, more crossover-y, uh, wagon-y kind of version. And then there's going to be one that is actually based on I believe a different platform that's interesting. Um, which is like a more conventional sedan that's got a lower ride height and stuff. Um, it, it's interesting that we got the kind of weird tall sedan version. Cause one of the things that I think does actually drive crossover SUV sales here in the States um, that actually maybe doesn't get talked about as much as it probably should is that, I think people actually do like having a hatchback. They just yeah. like having it in a slightly taller package. Um, that being said, in the U.S., we have the Toyota Venza that I think would kind of already occupy that slot um, as sort of a more premium, more stylish hybrid crossover than like uh, Highlander or um rav4 it's interesting when i we have a story up that kind of breaks down these like global options models that are out there i feel like there's at least one or two of them that would be very nice compliments it would really strengthen the crown if you will here in the u.s i think that would make a lot of sense and make it almost like its own little mini sub brand um so i think and honestly if they really want to try to win here with that. I think that could be a move is like, maybe don't pull the one that's like a Venza competitor, but offer up the hatch version here too. And I think that could work because all sorts of like crossover coupe SUV type things. I tend to think of like Mercedes and BMW a lot. You will look at them and I often will look at them in my driveway and think be a pretty good looking hatchback. It's just like an inch or two higher off the ground than it should be. So I feel like, you know, there is a market, there's some appetite for people who still kind of want a car, but just mentally they need to have that like ride height and utility thing. 
So that could work. That could definitely, you know, and then maybe just this more car like version, you know, becomes, you know, like the, the smaller volume model. I don't know. I mean, it's I think it's cool. I think the name is cool. I actually think it looks pretty good. I'm kind of optimistic just with like all of the like the way they're trying to bring this thing back, like with the name and again, the car sort of ethos. When I kind of look at all the different like, you know, like metrically, if you will, like you're going to like create a score sheet and try to look into the future. You know, I do kind of struggle to see how this stays around unless, you know, maybe they fully electrify it down the road and maybe that's where it finds, you know, a more traction. I don't know. We'll see. I don't, I definitely don't want to write its obituary before they've even sold one of them. But sometimes when you do look at these tweener cars, it's a little hard to figure out, you know, how it all adds up. Yeah. And also looking at the photos, one thing that I'm a little bit surprised at, the interior does not actually look as, um, as premium as like the outgoing Avalon. Yeah. The Avalon, for all of its faults, was actually a pretty nice car. So, mm -hmm. you know, I guess we'll see. Yeah. It'll, it, no matter what, it's going to be interesting. <laughs> all right. So a vehicle that's a little more defined is the Chevy Blazer EV. We uh, just saw it revealed this week. I think it's gorgeous. When I look at it, I think it really gives, um, it's the embodiment of a modern Chevy with strong design language. When you look at it, I think it, um, it honestly looks how you would expect like an American EV to look. It's, it has some attitude. It's very stylish. It's, um, a little bit over the top, maybe, I don't know, but I can't wait to see it in person. I think it kind of takes the idea behind like the, the ice blazer and takes it a step further as far as aesthetically, which I think is a good thing. The blazer, I think, is a pretty good looking crossover. Um, but this, I think, looks even better. The, the big story here, of course, is that it's all electric. It's going to be a police version of it, which I thought was kind of cool. Um, and there will be an SS model, which we did know, but now we got uh, a few more details on that. So a little wishy-washy on the crown, but for this, I think this is going to be a winner. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. I I do like the styling. I like the uh I like how swoopy it is. It's got high sections over the wheels and dips down low in between. I really like the fender vents that are scalloped into the doors and such. Uh it's got a nice long low look to it. It's maybe a little bit cluttered in some areas, but for the most part I think it's pretty cool. It's also going to be offered in a lot of different versions with a lot of powertrain variation. Um, base ones will be either front-wheel drive or all-wheel drive. Um, the SS will be all-wheel drive, and it will have 557 horsepower. Um, and then the RS, which slides in just below, can be had in front-wheel drive, all-wheel drive, or rear-wheel drive. Uh, which is really interesting. It's, I mean, from a mechanical perspective, it's not, it's not necessarily that difficult because when you're using electric motors and you're developing for having all wheel drive, you have one motor up front, one motor in the back. So going to either front wheel drive or rear wheel drive is just as simple as deleting one motor. <laughs> um, yeah. So it's gonna be it's gonna be interesting. Um, I am a little bit surprised that like base models are gonna be front wheel drive, um, especially when this feels very much like a Mustang Mach E competitor. Um, and the Mach E is either rear drive or all wheel drive. They don't offer a front drive version of it, which was probably wise because making a crossover version of a Mustang is already going to make the Mustang faithful kind of annoyed and to make it front wheel drive would have just sent them careening over the hedge. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think it looks good. I think all the performance numbers sound right. Um, the interior looks nice too. Uh, the big touch screen looks attractive. It's got, uh, thankfully, it's got plenty of like shortcut buttons and things, 
and volume knobs that should make it all easy to use, and it's got nice detailing on the air vents. Um, and also, I mean, with gas-powered GM vehicles, GM knows how to make a car uh, ride and handle well, so I'm looking forward to I'm looking forward to trying one out in the future. Yeah, this is definitely on my list of vehicles I'm very intrigued to get behind the wheel of. It's 2024 model, so a little bit of a gestation period, but it's coming. Um, I think it's interesting, too, the different takes you're seeing from the, the car companies here. The way the Mach-E, it's a Mustang, you know, then you've got the ID4, it's a crossover. And then the Blazer is, well, what is the Blazer? You know, I mean, it's, it's interesting because they use the Blazer name, uh, which a lot of us who are enthusiasts and of a certain age think of when you say Blazer, you think K5, you know, and then it's on this kind of like mid to compact crossover. Now it's an electric car. Uh, I think Chevy's going to get the the positioning right with this one, just in the fact that it's it's an electric crossover with a name you've heard of that looks good, and that's all it has to be. You know, I think it's it's pretty straightforward. They're trying to play up, I think, its merits and its strengths versus trying to steer into what the idea of it, you know, could be with a name. So they're kind of, you know, taking I think a little more, you know, practical. I think approach than maybe Ford did with the Mach E, where they really steered hard to making a Mustang. You know, it's it's a little closer to what Volkswagen is doing with the ID4. You know, just like, hey, this is our electric crossover. Here it is. So Yeah, and I do appreciate that this is like a new fresh design and it's not something uh retro based. Um kind of like Mustang Mach-E, but arguably even Hyundai Ioniq 5, which has very strong sort of 70s and 80s hatchback uh, vibes. Whereas this is, this is clearly its own thing that was designed today. Ioniq 5 too, and uh, Kia, uh, the GT, of course. I mean, it's, uh, wow, I'm totally blanking on the name. Kia electric vehicle, Ioniq 5. EV6. EV6, GT, yeah, wrong segment. I mean, just that segment is so full right now. When you you think of the you know electric options you could get, all with their own unique styling, all with um, just you know different ranges, different performance missions, uh, it's really going to be an interesting time to buy an electric car in the mid twenties. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, and I'm looking forward to getting more specifications on stuff underneath the SS because we've got the we've got the horsepower numbers for SS but obviously that's not going to be the volume seller. <laughs> yeah, I for me I'm just glad that the um SS is back frankly, you know, to have a SS, you know, it's still a Camaro SS but Chevy used that name quite liberally in the 90s and early 2000s, perhaps a little too um prolifically there were some Malibus and things that probably didn't quite deserve it. Although I would die on the hill that the HHR SS was actually a pretty good time. Um, but, you know, they, they got pretty austere with it, pretty judicious. And, you know, I, I think it's a good idea to roll it back out. An electric car is a great place for it. Um, kind of rethinks the mission of an electric car. You know, it can be a performance thing, you know, which, you know, is is definitely a thing that's not new. But I think it's a great thing for Chevy. So. You know, we have the Mach-E GT and a variety of different flavors of that. So that sounds like a fun comparison test. I'd show up for that one, right? You know, Blazer SS versus Mach-E GT. Oh, for sure. Yeah. And I mean, things should keep getting more interesting. I'm as neat as the Blazer is, I think I'm actually almost more anticipating the Chevy Equinox electric crossover since that's going to be even more affordable. Um, starting at around thirty thousand dollars as opposed to forty five so that that'll be extremely interesting i'd also i'd love to see Chevy do an s s version of the electric equinox but but I'm getting ahead of myself the equinox s s is okay I will say this the equinox like the electric version is another example of like really spectacular maybe I'm overselling it, but really good looking Chevy styling you know 
I mean, we saw pictures of that and it's like, whoa, you know, same with the Silverado EV, you know, they, Chevy is, I mean, they were the pioneers in design. General Motors was, Harley Earl, going back to the 50s. The only other company that even really tried in the mainstream segment before that was Lincoln, essentially. You know, that was Edsel Ford had an idea. He told his dad, hey, people like cars that look good. How about we try that? They don't all have to be Model Ts that look like horseless carriages and they're all one color, you know. You know, so General Motors, this is who they are. This is who Chevy is. And I think maybe articulating that through electrification is going to be a real strength for them. So, uh, and I like design, obviously. That's what I talk about half the time on the podcast. So, um, yeah, I mean, let's, let's just go back in time here or to the present. Uh, we got a, you know, full-throated V8 and the Raptor R, which, hey, sounds good. You know, we, we, we've talked about electrification. Let's, um, Let's also talk about just some old school V8 muscle here. The uh, the Raptor is getting it. Uh, it's not going to be a crazy high volume vehicle, but it certainly puts a, a traditional like halo back on the Raptor, you know. So for what it is, I think it's a good move. They have the engine. It fits under the hood. Why wouldn't you do this, right? It's the Shelby GT500 motor that's going to really give the truck some more power. So more power to them. That's my take. Literally more power to them. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, it's, it's a great thing for uh, blue oval backers. I mean, they don't have to, they don't have to, they don't have to deal with Ram TRX people saying like, oh, you've got two fewer cylinders and you've got a couple hundred horsepower less than me. Um, that's all been solved. And Raptor R is lighter than TRX, so should be should should outperform the TRX. Although I would hope it would outperform it because the price tag on the Raptor R is really high at a at a nearly a hundred nine that it's at a hundred nine thousand dollars for a T for a Raptor R. Um, the TRX still starts under six figures. I like that they're actually going back, if you will. This to me, this goes back to like the the origins of like the Lightning. You know, it's just like it's a go fast truck. You know, I think that's I like that idea. You know, it's it's not necessarily like my cup of tea as a consumer, but I as an automotive journalist, I'm glad it exists, and I'm glad that it. Um, you know, they're they're offering this. You know. Yeah, and I mean, and the Raptor R does deliver on not only just about matching power with the TRX, the Raptor R also has better approach, ground clearance, departure, breakover. It's got bigger tires. I mean, they, they definitely they definitely built this thing with the idea of we're not going to let the TRX just stand. <laughs> Um, yeah. and it is fun to see a bit of that rivalry again, kind of felt like we used to see that with like Camaro and Mustang and Challenger, but that, I, I, I don't know, is, is it just me or does it kind of feel like that fight has kind of cooled off a little bit? Camaro versus Challenger, you mean versus Mustang? I mean, the pony car, yeah. car wars, if you will, it's interesting because I feel like Camaro sales have been so kind of like middling. Mm -hmm. that they they've almost like i don't want to say they've taken themselves out of the fight but in some ways they made too good of a car if you will as far as it being a super sporty performance coupe but then it it just it got a little too much backed into a corner i think you've got the challenger which is just this kind of heavy thing that's all over the road but it's bigger and more usable and people like that and then the Mustang has always been the Mustang. So I don't know. Maybe the rivalry is cooling. It's a little bit like, you know, I don't know, in sports where one team wins all the time and you're like, well, it's still a rival. We, re we remember, you know, 1964 or something. But if one team doesn't win, then what is it in 2022? So, yeah, I think I might agree with you on that one. You know, thinking of these giant trucks, Something, something that would be interesting 
would be comparing Raptor R, TRX, and Hummer and GMC Hummer EV. Because mm, yeah. because GM, I mean, like the Silverado uh, Trail Boss ZR2 or yeah, Silverado yeah. ZR2. It's it's not really a true rival. I mean, like it's nice that they're it's nice that that's an option, but it's not really a competitor to these things. But GMC Hummer EV actually does have kind of the performance and the price tag to kind of be comparable to these trucks. Yeah, that's a good point. I think the Hummer, and I've actually been seeing a few more of them around the just around Metro Detroit. Maybe maybe you have too. I don't know. It's to me that's almost a little bit of a different thing too, just because it like on paper, you're you're totally right. I think it's kind of cool the way it, um, you know, it's positioned with that kind of like Hummer, like aura, if you will. Whereas, you know, Ford and Chevy still have just like, these are Silverados and F-150s. So I don't know. I kind of like the positioning too, because when you look at it, it like Hummer, I think says more luxury, whereas these are more like sport trucks. So, you know, regardless of the insane zero to 60 time and, and of course, crab walk, you know. Yeah, I mean, having been in the GMC Hummer, I I feel like it it's actually less of a luxury vehicle. I mean, it's still a luxury vehicle in the sense that it offers you a whole lot of stuff that you really don't need. But yeah, yeah I would agree with that. It's not it's not quiet by any means. I mean, despite being an electric car, like it's got loads of wind yeah. and tire noise and yeah. Um, oh, that tire noise. A hundred percent. That was outrageous. I remember driving it at Milford and it was like, they'll hear you coming in that thing. Yeah. And like the interior is well put together and definitely rugged, but it's not nice. Um, in like kind of the traditional luxury sense, it's, it's still lots of plastics and kind of hard wearing items, which Again, I think makes sense for the mission of that truck, but I think the mission of that truck is to be like a, um, like an off-road supercar kind of thing. Like it, and that, and in the same sense as TRX and Raptor are, that like these are built for maximum off-road performance. <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it's it's an interesting segment right now, and I think it's. It's interesting how like the pricing has gotten really just, um, I mean, pricing has gotten with inflation, like it's just gotten, some of these things are just, they're so expensive that you almost, it feels like they have to be like marketed as premium, regardless of how some of the things perform. I, I kind of like the interior of the Hummer. I thought it was, I drove a pre-pro model. I love that like skylight. It was like the whole inside was lit up. <clears throat> I think I would honestly go with the truck just to go off on a tangent here. I would go with the truck over the SUV just for the Hummer specifically, which is different than how I would with almost any other like things like this. Like I would always take the Wrangler over the Gladiator, et cetera. I just, if, I feel like the vibe of that kind of super truck really carries through with the Hummer. So. Yeah. yeah. And don't get me wrong. I actually do like the interior of the Hummer. I think it looks neat. Yeah. And it's got very usable infotainment stuff. It's just, you're not going to find like nice materials like metal and leather and, and uh, um, wood and stuff. Um, Cause it's built to be something that you can get dirty and clean off easily. And it's not going to get mm -hmm. scratched and scuffed and uh, broken. Um, it's just, it's a different kind of luxury, which I think, I think, we've been used to there being two kinds of luxury for like road cars. You've got the Rolls Royce and Bentley kind of luxury. And then you've also got like the Ferrari Lamborghini luxury. I think in the truck yeah. market, we haven't necessarily seen that as much. Like you've got, we've had like King Ranch and Denali and things that kind of fit that Rolls Royce, Bentley, cushy luxury. And now we've got the super truck luxury, which is the TRX Raptor R and like GMC Hunter EV. Um, like it's still premium, but it's a premium that's focused on off-road performance. Yeah. So while we're talking trucks, how about we just transition over to our drive section, which is trucks and sport and luxury cars. So uh, I had the Ram Rebel GT uh, last week. It um, I put a, you know some miles on it. It was basically my weekend vehicle. 
we took it to a Cars and Coffee, uh, the one over by Pastiners on Woodward. You ever go to that one, Joel? You know, I still haven't gotten there. I, I really need to. Um, it's just, it, it can be hard for me to get myself up that early on a Saturday. Yeah, no, I hear you. And it's actually, um, we get up early around here with the with the preschooler. So it's kind of like by 8 o'clock, 8.30, like we're, we're ready to get over there. We actually this weekend had kind of a slower, slower roll, if you will. And by the time we got there, some of the cars were leaving. And I was like, hey, this is actually even better because we're watching like, you know, there's an old Shelby Mustang that was starting up and rolling out and some dude in his Aston was like kind of honking as he came down the alley. So I think it's a great way to start your weekend, you know, your your Saturday anyway. If you get there early, apparently there's coffee. I've never quite gotten there that early, but uh, it's good cars and coffee. And yeah, anyways, I took the Rebel over to that. Uh, this one was bright red. Uh, it definitely gets a lot of attention. It certainly fills the lane and then some. Had the V8. Um, GT is like, it, it kind of gives it that sport truck vibe. You can get it on other versions of the Ram too. I think the Lariat, for example, it, you know, it just, it gives you kind of like a nice sort of things. Like there's aluminum paddle shifters. The shifter inside is a little bit different. I think it's leather topped. You get some better, like, uh, like an intercooler and then the hood, I don't want to call them scoops, but the vents are a little more prominent. Um, so stuff like that, a lot of graphics, uh, that type of thing. Um, I mean, it's fun. It's a truck. It's the Ram. It's the Ram Rebel. It's a lot of fun. Uh, this one had the tonneau cover on the back with like the in bed, like the bed liner and the rail kind of divider system. So it was one of those like sort of very like you can do a lot of stuff with this truck. You know, it'd be a good truck that I'd say take up north where you need to like load up the back. And sometimes with trucks that could be challenging if you don't have the tonneau cover. Um, Took it golfing, you know, I mean, not a lot of the things you necessarily would do with the Ram Rebel typically, but it was, you know, suburban weekend was fun. You know, it's um, I think the big takeaway I have is it kind of reiterates that I think the Ram is it's if it's not the best in the full size truck segment, it's up there and it wins for me based on how good the interiors are across the lineup, how good the infotainment system is. It's just, it's a beautiful, easy to use system. And, you know, it's just to me, it's a very strong competitor. Yeah, I think the GT package is really interesting. Uh, in part because I think it's interesting to see kind of more street oriented performance packages for the RAM. I think of the two, I would pick the Laramie GT as opposed to the Rebel GT, just because I feel like that's more in keeping with kind of the street focus it's got the paint bumpers and it's got kind of more road oriented wheels and tires just seems a little bit more gt-esque as opposed to something like the rebel which is a little bit more off-road oriented um i do think it would be kind of cool to see even more kind of street performance like the cat back exhaust and the paddle shifters for the GT models is fine, but it would be neat if they would offer it with like a few more handling upgrades, the 6.4 liter V8 from like the Challenger SRT 392. And the, and I think even the 2500 uses a, a version of that engine as its base V8. And yeah, I, yeah, I mean, it'd be especially cool if they would offer something like, I don't know, even like a Ram SRT 10, like Hellcat kind of thing. Just drop that Hellcat engine into a Ram and just have kind of a new muscle truck, kind of like the old Viper powered ones and the old F 150 Lightning. But everybody seems to kind of move toward off road stuff, which is, which is fine. I'd, but I wouldn't mind seeing some kind of old school muscle trucks. It's an interesting take, yeah. I like that naming scheme. I think a Ram Hellcat would be very strong, and I don't think it would take away at all from like the muscle cars. You know, I think people would just be like, "Oh, hey, cool." It's it's maybe the modern evolution of what SRT should have become. You know, I don't think it ever really took 
you know, those those letters don't mean as much as perhaps as they could, you know, but Hellcat, there you go. Yeah, I mean, Mopar has a whole bunch of different kind of Hellcat powered things. You've got Durango Hellcat um, and even just regular SRT. You've got Grand Cherokee SRT and Trackhawk. I don't know. I think the I think there'd be plenty of room for additional Hellcat street oriented sports trucks. All right, sounds good. So let's transition over to a pretty hot, pretty race bred Porsche that you've been testing out. What did you do with it, Joel? Yeah, so I actually took the GT3 grocery shopping. All right. I drove it over to Meyer and loaded it up with some milk and some toilet paper, just just kind of some basic errands. And surprisingly, with the with the frunk is actually quite large. So yeah. You know, it actually kind of worked out pretty well for grocery shopping. Granted, it's a little bit over the top. I mean, it's got a giant wing and it's bright red and it's got vents and it's got splitters and it's got giant wheels. It's maybe a little much, but, <clears throat> you know, it worked out all right. Um, and, I mean, it's just an all around really, really great car. I don't know that I'd say it's great for like kind of regular grocery shopping but you know if you want to take it out and have some fun with it it's i mean it does everything that you expect of a porsche it's got amazing steering feel and it feels lightweight it's really responsive the engine is amazing it revs out to 9000 rpm makes 500 horsepower it's got a great manual transmission that it's got crisp gates and kind of springs into each one um it is loud which again can be really good when you're revving it all the way out um the, the, the suspension is kind of stiff actually very stiff um but it's relatively compliant in normal mode um but yeah it's just it's amazing to drive it's got a great driving position um ergonomically it's great it's got amazing visibility um so much so that like you sometimes kind of forget that you're driving a supercar it's actually you know re reasonably easy to use and like you're not sitting on the ground and have horrible visibility so it's pretty amazing granted it's got some drawbacks. I mean, it is really loud. If you're just cruising around town and just kind of sitting at one RPM as opposed to like really flexing the power band, it uh, it kind of starts drilling into your head a little bit. It gets a little bit tiresome. And and the ride does can beat you up a little bit. Um, so like if I was a person of means, this would be an amazing car. Like if you want a track day car that you can just drive to the track and back, maybe run a couple errands in between um, without having to like load it up on a trailer and drive it. Cause it can totally do that. And because it's a Porsche, you know that you can just thrash it just all day long on the track. It's not going to end your day suddenly with some weird malady. And it's not going to like cost you a crazy amount of money to fix anything because it's not super, super exotic. So like it, that, that would be kind of what I think it would make. It'd be like kind of an ideal sort of like easy to use track day car. Um, not so much kind of a daily car. You can, you totally could daily it. Uh, it would just get kind of wearing. And like, if you've got the money for something like this, you've got the money to have another car or two or three. <laughs> so like, it makes sense as that kind of thing. And like, if I had that kind of means, I would definitely be looking at adding one to my garage. Wow. Okay. Strong praise there. I, um, side note, you mentioned doing crazy things with Porsches. I did take out in a Boxster and I had them, this was back like when like the pandemic was crazy, like two years ago. And like every restaurant was like, they'd come out in like hazmat suits and put your food in the car. And it was like, I had the frunk open and the person came out and put my food in it. So I was like, okay, hey, that's a good use of the frunk, you know, and um, worked out pretty well. Um, contactless delivery, if you will. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like if I were going to look for a, like a track car with 
some like a car that I could drive to the track, you know, just like, metrically, I like to use that cliche, like it would be tough to beat this thing. You know, I mean, just all of the, you know, the, it measures up in every measurable way, you know, um, I tend to think if I went with a 911, I would go with something more slightly above the, like the base car, because I feel like you get a lot of car with 911. You don't necessarily need to go up into some of these almost like race car settings to get the true feel of it. But yeah, I mean, this is, this is definitely cool. Um, I'm sure the, the denizens of Meyer were wondering what you were doing with that thing in the parking lot. But um, yeah, did you get to open it up at all? You know, expressway, anything like that, or some back roads or just feel a little bit of what it could do. Yeah. I've got a couple of kind of twisty long on ramps and off ramps near my house, which <clears throat> does kind of let me open it up a little bit. Granted, it's kind of hard to take advantage of all that that engine has to offer just with that super high red line. You're you're doing extra legal speeds pretty quick, kind of like in second gear or so. So like, there's only so much that you can get away with it on public roads. Yeah, no, I I can see that, and that's always the challenge when we get a car like this, awesome as it is. It can be tough to like, you know, adequately test them without you know getting yourself in trouble. Because obviously, you know, we want to be safe and all that good stuff. But um, yeah, awesome car. I imagine it was a little bit easier to stay at legal speed limits with the Hyundai, uh, you have the Elantra N version, right? So um, I think the Elantra N looks pretty good. I think the Elantra and the Sonata are, you know, pretty good as far as their design language. Uh, why, for the uninformed, what is the N version of the Elantra? So the N version of the Elantra is like the hottest version of the Elantra you can get. Yeah, it's got a turbocharged two liter four cylinder making around 276 horsepower. It comes with either a six speed manual or an eight speed dual clutch automatic transmission. It's got adaptive suspension and it's got a fancy electronically controlled front limited slip differential. And it's got visual upgrades and it's got interior upgrades. And um, it's just a super sporty version of the Elantra. And it's really, really good. Um, it's got loads and loads of grip, the limited slip diff on it. Uh, it makes it feel, it almost doesn't feel like it's front wheel drive because even when you're getting, even when you're putting the gas on in corners, it just, it just goes where you want it to. Um, I mean, if you push it hard enough and you start breaking traction, sure, it's going to start to understeer, but as long as you've got grip, it just, it just goes where you want it to. Um, Steering is quick. Uh, it's pretty weighty. Could use maybe just a little bit more feedback, but it's pretty good otherwise. Um, the engine has plenty of power, and it all comes on really smooth. The It feels pretty linear. It doesn't kind of have a big turbo surge all of a sudden somewhere. Um, if I was getting one... I would probably go with the manual as opposed to the dual clutch. The dual clutch is what this one had. And it's a good transmission, but the manual, which I've tried out in the Veloster N, which has like the same powertrain, it's a really, really, really good manual. It's kind of weighty and it's got really clear gates that feel good. Um, I just think it's a little bit more engaging and it is a good manual. And so like, if you don't want to miss out on it, granted, I don't have like California traffic and stuff where I would maybe want an automatic. And if you want it or need it, the dual clutch does pretty well. Um, it's fairly quick. It's, pr it's, it's actually quite smooth. Um, my only gripes are that it's got a couple of like the Hyundai Kia dual clutch uh, eccentricities where like coming away from a stop it kind of slips the clutches a fair uh, a bit more than I would expect, and the shifts aren't quite as fast as you would get from like uh, a Volkswagen dual clutch or even like um, really good tuned ZF eight speed autos. Um, ride wise, it's actually fairly comfortable. Um, it's still it's still stiff, but reasonably comfortable and normal. And it's adaptive; you can crank it up to where 
It's really stiff and kind of uncomfortable, but has like almost no body roll. And it's kind of the same deal with the exhaust. Uh, it's very quiet and normal mode, just a little bit of burble. And then it's got two louder versions. The middle one is just kind of more exhaust sound in general. And then the really loud one is that plus it throws in all the like pops and bangs and crackles and stuff that people like. My preference is kind of that middle one because I feel like I feel like the cracks and bangs have gotten a little bit overdone. Like once once automakers figured it out, they just started throwing it into everything and just make it pop and crackle like crazy. And you can kind of get on your nerves after a while, at least for me. Um but yeah, otherwise, like it's it's pretty livable. It does have really low profile tires. Um and there were a couple of times there were some bumps on my street that I wouldn't think twice about, but in this one, I hit kind of hard and was sometimes a little worried that I might have gotten a flat, but uh, fortunately I avoided that. But in general, it's just, it's a really good car. And like, in comparison to the Veloster Inn, it's got a much nicer interior. Um, and it's got a lot more space inside, uh, both for the front passengers, but especially for the back. Like, I was able to drive my parents around in it. Um so in a lot of ways, and so in some ways, it's actually better than a Veloster Inn. It's got all that performance stuff, but it's also in some ways a little more practical. And also the Elantra Inn is, it's it's decently priced. It's kind of low $30,000, which is more than like a Subaru WRX or Civic Si, uh, but it's also less than like what we're expecting Civic Type R and Corolla GR to go for. And it offers a lot of what you'd expect of those like kind of higher end uh, sporty cars. So it, yeah, it's, it's a great car and definitely worth your consideration. This is another car that I wonder how long it's going to be around, if you will, not to be all doom and gloom at, for different parts of this podcast, but like, I feel like if you want the type R or, you know, the Subaru WRX, you're going to probably want those cars for the, some of the, the heritage and the cachet they bring to the table. I don't know if like Hyundai, even with the end badging, really brings that to the table here. Um, yeah, on its merits, it's still a very strong, strong car. So, I mean, I guess we'll just see. I, I kind of wonder with Albert Bierman leaving Hyundai, how much some of these real like, you know, performance oriented models are going to continue. He, of course, was in charge of BMW M for a long time Then he came over to Hyundai and did some great things as far as upping their like, you know, their performance chops. So, I mean, change in leadership, sometimes some of the stuff is just natural, you know, meet the new boss, not the same as the old boss kind of thing and philosophies change. But um, yeah, funny story. I actually, I kind of regret passing on this car. Zach, our road test editor, Zach Palmer, you guys all know, was like, hey, you know, you're going to be on vacation next week. You want the Veloster N? I was like, well, I'm going to Chicago. Do you have anything a little bit bigger? He's like, okay, sent it over to, I think you and Byron got some time in it, which is great. And that's probably better. Um, so I ended up getting the Ram Rebel. And then I ended up not taking the Ram Rebel because the day before I was going to leave, I looked up my hotel's um, garage, like door requirements. And they listed it as six six, and I did quick some quick math. And I'm like, ooh, that's probably not going to fit with all you know the off road articulation and ride height with the Ram Rebel. And I think it may have fit, but I we ended up taking the family car, and I just drove the Ram a lot over the weekend, which was fine too. It was whatever. But talk about you know just not really playing your cards right as far as the press cars, if you will, and. That was a really tight parking garage. It's, I'm glad I didn't take the Ram either. I, I don't know if it would have fit just because I think it was one of those things where they list it as one thing, but there might be more actual room, you know, because there were F-150s in there. I digress, but that was my brush with the Elantra almost. So, so that's the Hyundai Elantra N. Now for Spend My Money this week, we have an update. Blake writes from episode 726 that he had been uh, torn between the 911, the Porsche 911, and getting a Cadillac CT5V Blackwing. We offered up some of our ideas for that, and Blake writes back that what he actually has done so far is he put in an order for a new 911, and then went ahead and bought an 08 911 Turbo. 
Uh, there's a bit of a wait time now for the new 911. So what he's going to do is basically enjoy that 08 turbo, drive it around, and then decide if he wants to go ahead with the new one or just cancel that order and enjoy his 2008 Porsche 911 Turbo, which I think is a great thing. It's kind of the best of all worlds. So if you enjoy the show, that's five stars on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. We are everywhere. Send us your Spend My Monies. That's podcast at autoblog.com. Be safe out there, and we'll see you next week.